Now we're ready to start looking at the respiratory system. And we'll start, of course, first with the anatomy, and that would include the respiratory tract. And all of the different components of the respiratory tract are listed over on the yellow post-it note. This video lecture is just going to cover those components that belong to the upper respiratory tract. So let's first, though, get an idea of the functions of the respiratory system. Obviously, it's to provide extensive surface area for gas exchange so we can move oxygen into the blood, CO2 out of the blood. Also, move air to and from those exchange surfaces, so inhaling, exhaling. To protect the respiratory surfaces from environmental variations, so we want to try to make sure the moisture temperature is constant. Actually, the environment of the lungs is more like a tropical rainforest in, in environment, so we need to warm the air and moisten the air as it enters. And of course, we want to eliminate the pathogens that could end up causing problems. And then, of course, the respiratory system, as I'm doing now, is to produce sounds for speech. And then, as we breathe in deep, another thing that the respiratory system helps it, or facilitate is olfactory or smelling. So let's first look at the organization of the respiratory system. We can divide it into the upper respiratory and lower respiratory. As I said, we're going to concentrate on upper respiratory. So those structures, the nose, nasal cavity, paranasal sinuses, pharynx, larynx. Lower respiratory then is all the farther down into trachea, bronchi, bronchioles, and alveoli. The last three really is what composes up the lungs themselves. So when you hear someone has an upper respiratory infection, it's going to be one of those structures listed at the top. A lower respiratory infection is just going to be uh, some of those structures down below. Depending on the source, sometimes the larynx is included in the lower respiratory, but we're going to go with what the book, uh, your textbook goes by. I can also divide the respiratory tract into conducting zones versus respiratory zone. A conducting zone is going to be from the nasal cavity to what are called terminal bronchioles. They are lined with respiratory mucosa to build up the moisture, trap microorganisms or dust or whatever to get rid of it. Um, but their job is simply to get the air from outside into the lungs or from the lungs in out. They're not going to be any involved at all in uh, respiration or as in gas exchange. The respiratory zone then, of course, are those structures where gas exchange can take place. So they're going to include the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar sacs and ducts, and then the alveoli as well. To look at the respiratory mucosa, which is found all the way along the conducting zone, the the mucous membrane that uh, provides all the mucus is made of pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. It has cilia on it to help move those trap dust particles and pathogens uh, to the throat so we can swallow them and then they end up in our stomach where they're killed. It also creates defensins, which is an antimicrobial or antibiotic that would help in destroying those pathogens. Underneath the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium is a lamina propria. In the upper respiratory um, tract, it contains mucous glands to make mucus and serous glands to make uh, watery fluid that contains our buddy lysozyme. And then in the lower respiratory, it uh, has more smooth muscle um, contained within it. Now let's start looking at some of the structures as we go from the outside down. So of course the first thing is the nose. It functions to provide airway for respiration, uh, moisten and warm the air, filter and clean it, uh, resonating chamber for speech. As you know, if you try to plug in your nose and talking, you sound a little funny, like you have a cold, uh, how people sound a little strange. That's the resonating chamber for speech. And then olfactory receptors, which are located way up at the top of the nasal cavity up here. And so if you want to breathe or smell something, you breathe deeply, so you smell it. If you try to avoid it, then you breathe either through your mouth or breathe very shallowly. And that way the air isn't moved up to the top, so you have to smell it as well. You probably learned when you looked at 
the uh, skeletal system, the meatus and conchi. The meatus is the passageways, the conchi are these little, almost looks like um, curlicues inside the nose. They are there to help create turbulent airflow. That way it slows the air down and causes it to twist and turn so that it's more, the nose is more likely to trap uh, particles that may get, um, or that you inhale. And so then that helps clean and moisten and warm the air as it progresses. That also the nasal cavity is going to be lined with um, respiratory mucosa, again, to produce lots of mucus so we can get all of those, those dust and pathogens trapped. Now in the winter, as we're getting colder now, um, you might get a runny nose. And the reason being is that any cilia that's in the nasal cavity in cold temperatures can become sluggish. So it's not as effective at um, moving the mucus to the back of the throat so that you end up swallowing. It goes down your throat and you swallow it. Also, when you exhale, all that water vapor that's trapped, that's in the warm air that you're exhaling, hits the colder air of the nasal cavity and cold air can't hold as much moisture. So all that moisture is going to come out of solution and condense in the nose. So both between the cilia not working and the water vapor condensing, you end up with a runny nose in the winter when you go outside. Now the paranasal sinuses also produce mucus secretions and their job is to help lots of things. One, light, lighten the skull. If we had, if the parent nasal sinuses weren't there, our skull would be a lot heavier and that would be a lot more weight to hold up. Um, it also helps moisten and warm the air again to get it ready to can move down into the lungs. Of course, if you have a sinus infection, that's called sinusitis. That could be a bacterial or viral infection that's causing um, mucus to get trapped in those sinuses, increasing pressure, and you get a sinus headache. Rhinitis is inflammation of the nasal mucosa. This is going to be a cold. Um, so you have excessive mucus production, nasal congestion, that post-nasal drip that can often lead to sore throats. And again, this could be cold virus typically, or it could even be streptococcal bacteria or allergens that could lead to rhinitis as well. The next structure moving down then is going to be the pharynx. We're familiar with the pharynx when we talked about digestive system, but the pharynx is going to be separated again into three components. Now we get to include the nasopharynx. This part is just the region from the nasal cavity to the back of the throat, really about to the area of the uvula. It has pseudostratified columnar epithelium because of the fact it's still making mucus to trap stuff that's come by. It also contains the um, tube or to connection to the middle ear. That's the ostachian or auditory tube. The oropharynx is stratified squamous. Remember when you're swallowing food, you, you want some nice uh, protective layer of tissue um, to handle the friction from that food. So that would be the oropharynx. And the laryngopharynx would also have stratified squamous epithelium, again, protective from all the food that you swallow. The larynx is the next structure down. So the larynx is our voice box. It also um, provides an open airway to leading to the trachea. So we can act as a sort of switching station um, to help route air and food in the right direction. That's the job of the epiglottis. So the epiglottis will fold over to make sure the food goes down into the esophagus, and so air goes only down into the, um, tra into the larynx and trachea in order to inhale or exhale. Of course, the big function of the larynx, too, is for voice production. It has numerous cartilage and muscles associated with this, um, which we're not going to get into the details of, but the idea is they are for par partly for protection of the epiglottis, uh, as a function of the epiglottis, or production of sound. If we look at the vocal cords, you can see the structures here as you look down. This is looking down someone's throat. So in the diagram here, the opening that leads down further is called the glottis. So you can see it's it would be the whole in this picture, just be that black slit here, 
would be the glottis. The true vocal cords are here in white, or here. Those are the actual ones that are producing the sound. And then they have the false vocal cords or vestibular folds on each side. Now pitch for these vocal cords is going to be determined by the diameter, length, and tension of the vocal folds. Think of it like guitar strings. Thicker strings make lower sounds. Thinner strings, thinner or even shorter strings, make higher pitch sounds. And so that's what we do. Um, changing the tension on those um, vocal cords would change the pitch. Now children have very slender vocal folds, uh, so their pitch is going to be very high. At puberty, the um, larynx enlarges, particularly in males, uh, in response to uh, testosterone. And since it enlarges, that makes the string, the uh, vocal cords, full, or excuse me, the vocal cords, um, longer and thicker, and that's what causes the male voice to drop. Even females have a slight drop in voice, but males have a very substantial drop in their voice. Um, and it happens so fast that the brain hasn't adjusted to this now new vocal cords, and that's why you end up getting um, that scratchy or, or, or weird, you know, break cracking sound that, that uh, males in puberty often have. Um, adult vocal folds are thicker and longer again, um, and that's why our voices tend to be lower. So that ends our look at the upper respiratory tract, and so the next video lecture we're going to look at the lower respiratory tract.